We're going to wrap up our series this morning, Embrace the Mess. We've been in it for the past couple weeks, and man, it's just been good to um, spend some time in God's Word, looking at the Sermon on the Mount, look at what Jesus has to say about dealing with this messy world that's around us. Man, it's a, it's a mess, is it not? And so that's why he came, that's why he died, and so um, he left us instructions in his word in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew about how to deal with it, how to deal with the mess, how to embrace the mess. And we looked at a couple of different things. We looked at temptation, how to handle that, how to handle marital conflict, how to deal with difficult people. And maybe for some of you, those are synonymous. I don't know. Don't look at your neighbor. I see people looking at their neighbor. That's not good, guys. Don't look, don't look next to you. Um, we've looked at how to deal with people that have hurt us and what Jesus has to say about those things. And this morning, we have one more message to wrap up this series. And we're going to be looking at a familiar passage, like Pastor Richie said at the top. We're looking at these words by Jesus where he says, do not judge. And so we're going to look at what he has to say. If you have your Bible this morning, we're going to jump right into this thing. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. So I'll give you guys five more seconds to get it pulled up on your phone or to find it in your Bible. And we have it on the screen for those of you that don't have either one of those things. So let's read this together here in Matthew chapter seven. This is the words of Jesus. This is Jesus teaching. And he said this, he said, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I want to speak today on a message entitled, Pulling Planks. Pulling Planks. Not not pulling pranks. I had somebody tell me this morning, they were like, I saw your your sermon and I thought it said pulling pranks. No, it's not pulling pranks. It's got an L, pulling planks. And so if you know me very well, you know I don't like pranks. And they know this very well here around the office. But still people think it's funny to go into my office and decorate everything with Christmas wrapping paper, even though it's March. And uh, so uh, the other week that actually happened, I came in early one Tuesday morning, and I should have known something was up because one of our staff members was here before me that normally is not here (laughs) before everybody else. I'm not going to mention any names. And uh, I should have known something was odd, and uh, I walked into my office, and everything was wrapped and wrapping paper, the desk, the chair, every pen, and then the pen cup holder was wrapped with the wrapped pens inside. My business cards that I have were wrapped. Everything was wrapped. And so I sat down. I didn't unwrap everything because I had something I needed to do. And all the time I'm being filmed, right, by this person that came in early. That's, that's why they were there early, was to film my reaction Um, but they didn't know they were going to have to unwrap it all for me. And so lesson learned, okay? I don't like pranks, all right? So we're not talking about how to pull pranks this morning. We're talking about how to pull planks. Can we pray? Can we pray together? Father, we give you this time. I pray that you speak right now. These words that you've spoken over me, you've given me as I've studied, as I've prepared. God, would these words be your words, not my words? Holy Spirit, would you speak today? I feel there is someone in this room that needs these words. I don't know who it is. I don't know what it is. But God, you want to speak today. And so God, I surrender my mouth to you. I surrender my whole body to you. Would you use it today to your glory? In the name of Jesus, we pray. All God's people said, amen. Well, if the the world around us 
in the culture around us were to have a favorite Bible verse, I think Matthew 7, 1 would probably be their favorite verse. You, you hear people in the world, you've probably maybe even seen it on celebrity t-shirts. Um, they say, hey, you can't judge me. Only God can judge me. And they're trying to quote this verse and trying to quote Jesus here in Matthew chapter 7. Um, and there's a problem when you only take one verse like this and you take it out of context and you try to apply it and you try to interpret it without uh, using the context of the rest of the verses and the rest of what Jesus is trying to say. When you you take one verse and you pick it apart just for uh, your own use to say what you want to say, that's dangerous, dangerous ground. And so always consider the context of where the verse is found and what else Jesus is trying to say here. And if you do that, you'll, you'll realize that in the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus is trying to uh, communicate something different than just saying, hey, don't judge, okay? He's, he's, he's not saying to not have judgment or have discernment. I, I hope and pray that y'all don't leave here today and think what God's trying to say is to not judge and not use discernment because that'll get you in a whole heap of trouble. I'm here to tell you. So I don't wanna see next step cards turned in next week saying, hey, what's the deal? Because I went on Tinder and I swiped right to the first person that I saw and my date went terrible. Don't do that. Don't hire the first person that comes in the office or turns in an application just because you don't want to use judgment. No, please use judgment. Please use discernment. That's not what Jesus is trying to say here. And I can promise you this, there will be judgment and discernment whenever Charlotte starts to date when she's 38. There will, there will be judgment. There will be discernment. There will be background checks and random drug screenings and polygraph tests, I'll invest in it wherever I can get it. You know, with anybody that she plans on getting in the car with, there will be judgment, there will be discernment. So that's not what Jesus is trying to say here. He's not saying to not use good judgment and not to have discernment. And in fact, scripture actually paints a different picture. It tells us otherwise. It actually tells us to practice good judgment. Jesus says that somewhere else in scripture. Um, Proverbs talks about the same thing, to have wisdom, to have judgment, to have good discernment. And so that's not what Jesus is trying to communicate here. If we read all the passage here in Matthew and what he's saying um, as a whole, we'll we'll get a better picture of what he's trying to communicate. Um, And and what you'll see is that Jesus wasn't saying not to judge, but to the, whether the spirit to which you judge others, then you will be judged. Let's look at this, Matthew 7, verse two. Let's put it back up on the screen. It says this, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. The same way, the same way you judge others, so you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So how, how are we to judge? How are we to do this? Matthew 5, verse seven gives us a little bit of insight. Jesus said this earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God wants us to show mercy to those that are around us. He wants us to love the ones we judge. Whenever I was kind of going through different sermon titles, I always, when I'm sitting down, I'm I'm scribbling notes, I always do that on a piece of paper as I'm preparing before I actually write the message and one thing I always brainstorm is different sermon titles. And the sermon title for this message started out, love the ones you judge. Love the ones you judge. And as I started picking that apart and what God wanted to say, it all came back to the idea of pulling planks out of our eye. And so that's where we landed on pulling planks. But the initial title was love the ones you judge. And I, I, I love this. I want to talk about our vision statement here for a minute as a church. I, I love our vision statement. Um, if you don't know it, if you're new here, um, or maybe you don't have it memorized, I encourage you, if you call Avalon Church home, you have to memorize this vision statement because it is what everything revolves around. It is the heartbeat of what we do. It is the heartbeat of how we serve. It's the heartbeat of how we worship, how we preach, how we teach, how we do everything in this house comes from this vision statement. And I remember when I, when I 
I came to Avalon, I, I, I adopted it for myself because it's such a beautiful vision statement. It says this, it says, bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And everything that we say, everything that we do, it all filters through that vision statement. It all filters through that. And I just wanna pick out and highlight a couple things as we set the stage for what God wants to say this morning. And the first thing is this, is that word people. It's that word people. See, we all come from different backgrounds. We were born in different states. We may have been, been born in different countries. And if you look around the room, there's People here, we have different skin colors, we have different accents, you know, we have different um, opinions. You know, some of us might vote different than the person sitting next to us, and that's okay. But there's one thing that we all have in common, no matter all of those things, is we are all people, and sometimes I think this world, and sometimes I think we as a church sometimes forgets the fact that we are people. We all have that in common. We are people. We are created in God's image. We are his handiwork. You know, it says that we were knit together in our mother's womb. We were created by him. And if you think about the creation story, if you go back and you think about those, that, that, that six-day period where God created the heavens and the earth and he, and he put the moon in the, in the sky, he put the sun in the sky, he put the birds in the air, he put the fish in the sea, and then he, he, he said one thing. What did he say? He said always, he said, and I looked back at the end of the day and said, it was good. All of those things, all of those things are good. But then on the sixth day, and, and he did something different. It happened a different way. All those other days, Jesus, our, our, our God spoke and he said, hey, let there be light. And there was light. Let there be a sun, and there was a sun. Let the birds fill the, the sky, and, and the birds were in the sky, and let the fish fill the sea, and then the fish were in the sea. And he said, and it was good. But then on the sixth day, when he created man, he did something a little bit different. He said, let us, talking about the Trinity, let us create man in our image. We're not gonna just say, hey, let there be a man. No, let us create and form him in our image. Anytime you feel like you're not good enough, anytime you feel like you don't measure up, anytime someone else tells you that you're not good enough and you don't measure up, you know that I was formed by God, by hand, to be just the way I am for a purpose. For a purpose. You're a person with a purpose. And then he said, <laughs> then he said, it was very good. Everything else was good. Everything else was beautiful. Everything else was great. But when man came, when God knelt down to the dust of the earth, when he knelt down and he took his hands and he scooped dust up and he formed you by hand, he said, it was very good, very good. And then he did something even more. He knelt down again and he breathed his life into your nostrils and your heart started to beat. And your lungs started to inhale and exhale. Everything else was spoken into existence. But you were created by God with a purpose. We are people. Don't forget that. As we talk about embracing the mess and how to deal with those that judge us and how we are not to judge, we can't forget that those around us are people, we're people, bringing people. The second thing, wherever they are, wherever they are. We're called to love those around us, even when it's difficult, even when it's hard, even when we don't understand it, even when it hurts. 
We're called to love and to show mercy and to give grace, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it's messy. Jesus was never afraid of the mess. Jesus was never afraid to get down and dirty into the mess of those people that were around him. If you look at the people that Jesus surrounded himself with the most, they were messy people. They were messy people. He embraced the mess. He ran towards the mess because sometimes the bigger the mess, the greater the miracle. Amen? The bigger the mess, the greater the miracle. This past week, we were on a missions trip to Jacksonville. We got back in on Friday, um, and it was awesome. Those of you that were in the room that went, you know what I'm talking about. It was a special week down there in Jacksonville with Pastor Paul of 360 Church. Um, and, and we were in an area called Springfield, Jacksonville. It's actually downtown Jacksonville. It's not the place with all the buildings, but it's this community. It's this neighborhood with all these homes, with all these beautiful porches. They're trying to uh, revitalize the neighborhood, bring new life to the neighborhood. And I remember on our on Thursday, the, oh no, on Wednesday before we left, we, we went to lunch with Paul before we um, went back to the hotel to get ready to go serve with the kids. Um, and I remember standing on Main Street with him as we were getting ready to get back in our car. And we were just talking about, hey, this is just an awesome area, how it's being revitalized and they're putting new restaurants in and they're, you know, they're putting paint on the sides of the uh, walls, and they're just really trying to dress it up so it'll attract new people. And I remember him saying this. We were just kind of looking at it. He said, underneath the surface, there's so much hurt. And you can put paint on the walls. You can try to bring in new people. But he said, there's so much hurt here. There's su such a literal mess <laughs> in Springfield and I remember uh, those that were working outside with me, we cleaned up the bushes outside the Boys and Girls Club and then we pulled back up the next morning. We had cleaned all this trash out and then there were, was more trash in the bushes and we kind of pulled up and we were like, what in the world, come on. You know, we just cleaned up this mess and now there's a mess back here and this area is such a mess. But Paul has such a vision. He has such a vision. And the greater the mess that he sees in Springfield, he sees a greater miracle because he knows what God can do when he gets his hand on a mess. Because the bigger the mess, the bigger the miracle. The greater the struggle, the greater your story. There's testimony in this room of people that had struggles and addictions and hangups and hardships and you are on the other end of it now and you're a living, breathing testimony that the greater the struggle, the greater the story. And so when we sing a song like Mercy, you're belting it out, you're singing it as loud as you can because you know it's true, you know it's, it's your heart, it's your story, it's your testimony. The bigger the mess, the bigger the miracle. And there's no mess that God can't clean up. There's no mess that he can't handle, that he runs away from. He embraces it all. And he wants us to do the same thing. And I think sometimes our problem is, is when we look at a person, all we see is problems. But when God looks, he looks past the problems and he sees the person. He looks past the problems and sees the person. We, we struggle with that. We look at people and we, and we judge and we, we, all we see is what could be better. All we see is what they've done wrong or how they've hurt us. But God looks past that and he sees the person. And he wants us to do the same thing. He wants us to do the same thing. And he gave, and he gave us a, a beautiful picture here in Matthew 7 in this scripture, Let, let's pick it up here, Matthew 7, verse three. He says this, he says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, that's a hard word. It's a hard word, but he says it with love. First, take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. God wants to use us to help those that are around us, but first we have to surrender our own stuff. We all got stuff. We all got stuff. 
And even when we try to pretend like we don't got stuff, we got stuff. We got stuff. And Jesus says, if you're gonna love like me, if you're gonna serve like me, if you're gonna follow me, if you're gonna do what I do, if you're gonna say the things that I say, first you gotta deal with your own stuff. We all have stuff. We all have planks that are in our eye that need to be pulled. And and notice this, notice this. Notice where the planks and the speck are located. I think this is important. I think this is important. Where is it located? In the eye. You guys are smart. You guys are smart. Yeah, it's located in the eye. How many of you ever got something stuck in your eye? How many of you ever got something stuck in your eye? It's painful. It's painful. It's irritating. It's rough. When I was a kid, I was about five years old, and I got something in my eye. We didn't know what it was. And for weeks, it hurt, and my eyes watered really bad. This is one of my first memories. And I remember it just hurting so bad. They didn't know what it was. I went to the eye doctor. They put a patch on it. They said, hey, if it got scratched, then give it a few days. It'll heal um, on its own. And we did that. And then I went back to the doctor and he said, hey, it's just not, it's not healing. That's not what it is. And so they got in there and they, they put me on this chair, right? I'm five. How many of you got a five-year-old? Can you imagine going to the eye doctor and saying, hey, 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 sweetie, just, just be still, just be still. They're gonna shine this bright light in your eye. They're gonna, do, they're gonna dig around in there, but it'll be all right, it'll be all right. And so for hours we were there. And, and this is the part that I remember. It was traumatizing, probably more so for the doctor than me. Amen. And so it was a traumatizing experience for everyone involved, me, my mom, the doctors. And they got to the point where they said, we're going to try this one more time. If this doesn't work, we got to send them to the hospital. They're going to have to sedate them and we're going to have to figure out what's going on. But my mom, I I talked to her this week about this story and she said, we went back out to the waiting room and I had a a, a talking to and said, we're going to go back in there. I don't want to go to the hospital. I don't want that bill in my life. And so you're going to be still. And then she took a belt and she, no, she didn't do that. Uh, And so uh, she said, you're going to be still and we're going to get this thing out. And we went back in there and they did. It was a piece of plastic. So small. So small. We don't know how it got in there. We don't know where it came from. But it was the small piece of plastic that just irritated and rubbed and aggravated and hurt. When you get something in your eye, it's painful and it's traumatic. The, the eyes are one of the most sensitive areas of the body. And if you're gonna get something out of it, it takes a couple things, and I've kind of listed them out here. It takes patience, right? It takes patience. It takes precision. You gotta know what you're doing. You gotta know how you're gonna go in there. You gotta know what you're gonna do. It takes patience. It takes precision. It takes pain. We don't like that, right? We don't like that four-letter word, pain. But it takes pain and it takes people to help. And there are people in your life, there are people in my life, they need your help. because They've got something in their eye and they can't get it out on their own. And Jesus has told us to help them. But first, we gotta pull the planks out of our own eye. And I've got three points for us here, just really fast of what happens when we pull the planks out of our eye. And the first one is this, pulling planks restores our relationship with God. Pulling planks restores our relationship with God. There's probably no better story in the Bible of of an illustration of this than David after he sinned with Bathsheba. And I'm not gonna go through the whole story, we don't have the time. I love David, I love all the examples um, that are in scripture of him and how it relates to us, how we can apply them to our life. And, but here's, here's what happened if you're new to church or if you don't know. David was king and he was up on the roof one day and he saw Bathsheba bathing on the roof and he liked what he saw, okay? We don't have to go into any other detail. And he invited her over and they committed adultery. And then he tried to cover it up because she became pregnant. So he tried to cover it up by having, his, having uh, her husband killed. And it was just a snowball effect. One thing after another, one thing after another, one thing after another. And over time, David developed a plank in his eye. 
developed a plank in his eye. And so God sent the prophet Nathan to go talk to David. If, if I was Nathan, I would not want this job because <laughs> all David has to do is have him sentenced to die. And so God tells Nathan to go and Nathan obeys and he goes to David. And, and, and I love this story in scripture. If you have time, look it up. Nathan comes to David with this hypothetical story of a man that um, he stole and killed another man's lamb. So Nathan tells him this story and he's, he says, you know, what should we do with this man? And David quickly judges and condemns the man in the story. And then without skipping a beat, Nathan looks at him in the eye and he says, you're the man. You're the man. And quickly, David immediately is convicted. He repents of his sin and he writes a psalm, Psalm 51. And it says this, Psalm 51 verses one through two, it says, have mercy on me. How quick are we to beg for mercy in the same situation that we judge and condemn somebody else for the same situation? But when it happens to us, oh God, have mercy, have mercy on me. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Skip down to verse 10. It says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Look at this. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. David had developed and was living with a plank in his eye. And because of that plank in his eye, he felt isolated from God. He had never felt this way before. And so he's saying, God, would you please forgive me? Would you blot out my transgressions? Would you put a clean spirit within me? And would you restore to me the joy of your salvation? And there are those of you today, you're living with planks in your eye. Some of you, you've been living with it so long, you've been dealing with it so long, you've pushed it so far down that maybe you don't even realize it, you've become so blind to it that you don't even realize it's there anymore, you've, you've learned how to numb the pain, you've learned how to get along with this plank in your eye, and you've buried it so far deep down and, and you've let the enemy convince you that this is who you really are. But God is saying to somebody here today, this is not who you were meant to be. I've got a higher calling on your life. And just like Nathan was sent by God, God is telling someone today, you gotta deal with this. You gotta deal with this. God's looking past your problem. He sees past your problem, past your plank, and he sees the person underneath the surface. And he wants you to live in freedom. He wants you to know joy. When's the last time you felt joy? Some of you might say, man, it's been a long time. I forgot what joy felt like. I forgot what joy is. And I'm not talking about laughing at something funny on TikTok or YouTube or, you know, all those things that we kind of mask our pain and mask our hurt with just things that numb the pain. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about joy. I'm talking about joy in the pain and the hard times, even when it doesn't make sense. Joy that only comes from the Lord. When's the last time you felt that joy? It only comes from a relationship with God and Maybe it's been a long time. Maybe you've never felt that. Maybe you're here today and you've never had a true relationship with the Lord and felt what it's like to, to walk with God and talk with God and laugh with God and cry. David did all those things. And you see it as a reflection in scripture as he writes the Psalms. You see the ups, you see the downs. He's, he's brutally honest at times. He's rejoic he rejoices at times. He cries at times. And now he's messed up that relationship. He's got this plank between him and God and it's left him isolated. 
And he knew in order to restore his relationship with God, he had to pull the plank. And so for those of you today that that feel disconnected from God, that feel distanced from God, you can restore that relationship. You just got to pull that plank. And and when you do, I I love what it says, what what David wrote later in Psalm 51. after, After the plank is pulled, read this in Psalm 51, 13. It says, then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Not only does pulling planks restore our relationship with God, but pulling planks shows us how to help others. But first, you gotta pull the plank out of your own eye and then you can help others. And David, once this is removed, once he feels the, the freedom and the joy is back, he says, I will teach other transgressors your way so that all sinners will turn back to you. God, would you leverage my story so that other people won't make the same mistake, so that other people can feel this freedom, so other people can know this joy that you and I have. And David's focus shifts from a heart of condemning that man in the story to a heart of caring for others. And that should be our hope. That should be our prayer. Once David dealt with his own stuff, his focus shifts. You can't focus on things clearly when you have something stuck in your eye. When something's in your eye, you're all squinty, your eyes are watering, you can't focus, you can't do things the right way because it's stuck in your eye. But once it's removed, you can see clearly how to help someone else. And Jesus said this in Matthew 7, in verse 5, it says, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Experiencing having the plank pulled from our eyes helps show us, and help shows us how to identify the speck in the planks in other people's eyes. Once you feel that relief, once you feel what it's like to have your relationship restored, once you feel like the relief it is to have that plank pulled from your eye, you want that for others. And it's our desire, again, as a church to to fulfill our vision of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus. And we do this by having a heart that loves, not a heart that judges. So when someone comes into this house and and they look different than you, they talk different than you, it looks like they struggle with something that maybe you've overcome or something you've never struggled with, we don't judge them, we love them. We don't judge them, we love them, we care for them, we don't condemn them, we care for them. And we welcome them in. And we welcome them in and we surround and support each other because God surrounds and loves and supports us. And don't let us ever forget Don't let us ever forget that what you judge someone for today might be the battle that you face tomorrow morning. Let that sink in for a minute. That thing that you think you'll never never struggle with, that battle you think you'll never have to fight might be the battle that you wake up and have to face at work tomorrow morning. That thing that you judge somebody else for might be the very thing that you face this week, or next month, or later this year. Don't ever think that you're immune to the attacks of the enemy because he's out there. He's always waiting like a lion to devour those of us that believe in Jesus. He's uh, seeking to kill and to destroy us. And so don't ever think that you're immune from the attacks of the enemy. No, don't judge others, love them. Don't judge others, love them. Because God loves us. And this is the third part this morning. Pulling planks reminds us of God's love. Pulling planks reminds us of God's love. Not only does it restore our relationship with God, not only does it show us how to help others, but it reminds us of God's love. John 3, 16, probably one of the most famous verses in the Bible. It says this, for God so loved, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved. He so loved us. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his own love for us, then while we were still sinners, Christ came, Christ died for us. He loved us that much. God didn't just say he loved us, he demonstrated. 
He demonstrated his love. He put action to his love. He put motion to his love. He demonstrated his love. He took on flesh. Jesus did. He took on flesh. He left his throne in heaven. He left uh, all the, the luxuriousness of heaven to come to earth to be human, to take on human likeness, just like you and I, to walk the ground that we walk, to, to cry like we cry, to laugh like we laugh, to have relationship with others like we have relationship with others. He left heaven to come to earth to do that. But here's the thing. He was despised and rejected when he got here. He was despised and rejected. He wasn't understood. And it led to the very thing that we celebrate this upcoming weekend. It led to the cross. They took the Savior that came from heaven and they mocked him. They ridiculed him. They spit on him. They pulled his beard. They laughed at him. took a crown of thorns and they shoved it on his head. They didn't just place it there. They crammed it down on there. He's bleeding. He's hurting. He's lonely. Everyone abandoned him. And there he is on that hill. And he loved you so much. So much that he endured the pain, he endured the rejection. Isaiah says that he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. And it goes on to say that the Lord laid on him the iniquities, the sin of all of us. Not only did Jesus suffer the pain of the cross, but he suffered the weight of all your sin, all my sin, the sin of every man, woman, boy, girl that's ever lived, that's living now, that ever will live. It says that God put it all on him. Can you imagine the weight? Can you imagine the weight. I know what it's like for me to carry the weight of my own stuff. I got a whole truckload full of two by fours and planks. And that that's heavy stuff. But Jesus carried it all. Can you imagine the weight as he walked up that hill carrying that cross all by himself? Can you imagine the weight that's on his shoulders as he's hanging on the cross, as he's struggling to breathe, that weight that's on his shoulders? It's the same weight you and I feel when we screw up and we screw up and we screw up. He bore that for you. He bore that for me so that we could have life. That we could have life. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus on that Christ, on that cross, you don't have to live with that plank in your eye. You don't have to live with that plank in your eye. So whatever it is today that you're struggling with, that you've struggled with for 10, 20, 30 years, that weight you've carried, that weight you've gotten used to, You don't have to live with it anymore. Romans 8, 1 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And today, there are people that walked in this room carrying a weight that isn't meant for you to carry because Jesus already carried it up that hill and he died so that you don't have to carry it anymore. He died so you don't have to live with that oppression anymore. 
See, the verdict for every one of us is guilty and the sentence is death. But there was one that paid that penalty for us. He paid that penalty for us. So you don't have to. Can we have every eye closed and every head bowed in the room today? If you're joining us online, I don't care where you are. If you're in the car, I want you to pull over to the side. If you're watching this later, wherever you are, if you're in your office, if you're at home, wherever you are, this is a moment. This is a moment. If we're gonna love and not judge, we first have to deal with our own stuff. And so maybe you're here today and you don't know who Jesus is. You've never been in a relationship with him. You've never known what it's like to to live a joy-filled life. You've never had that uh, joy of his salvation. You've never felt that relationship with him. You can do that today. And I just want to lead you in a simple prayer. And you can pray this right where you are. You can pray this whether you're at home or whether you're here in this room, wherever you are today, you can pray this prayer. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you as a sinner. Make me brand new. I believe Jesus died and rose again that I could have life. Today, I give my life to you. Fill me with your spirit so that I could live for you, serve you, and follow you the rest of my life. Today, I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just real quick, just real quick while we're in this moment, and I know people are already looking around, but that's okay. That's okay. If you're here today and you want to give testimony that you prayed that prayer today, remember Jesus walked up that cross for you. Remember Jesus gave it all for you. He was not ashamed to endure the rejection, endure the shame, endure the pain of the cross. He's not ashamed of you. And so today, if you prayed that prayer on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand. Three, two, one. If you prayed that prayer this morning to receive Jesus, can you just raise that hand? Raise that hand. I see it. I see it. I see it. I'm just gonna pray for you really quick. And here's what I want you to do. And we'll talk about this just here in a second. There's a blue card. I want you to fill that out. It's sitting in the card in front of you. Just mark, I received Christ today. We wanna follow up with you. We wanna get to know you and and tell you about your next steps as a new believer in Jesus. But I'm just gonna pray for you, church. Can we just pray for those that received Christ this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the new life that is being born in this place today, what you are doing in the hearts and the lives of those that are in this room, those that are watching online, those that will see this later, wherever they are. God, thank you for what you're doing this morning. God, I pray for each and every one of these people that you give them the strength to go forward now after this decision to live for you. God, would you help us as a church to surround each and every one of them, to lead them in their next steps as a new believer. And so God, would you be with them today? I thank you for the new life that's being born today. And we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Can we all just stand to our feet? We're going to sing a song this morning. We're going to sing a song and just let this song be a testimony, be a testimony of the love of Christ that you know that you have received today. And so let's all sing together. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.